Our scripture reading this morning is Daniel 9, 1 through 19. In the first year of Darius, the son of Asuerus, by descent of Mede, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the numbers of years that according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet, must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. Then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession, saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, we have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness, but to us open shame as at this day to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to all Israel, those who are near and those who are far away, in all the lands to which you have driven them, because of the treachery that they have committed against you. To us, O Lord, belongs open shame, to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God by walking in his laws, which he set before us by his servants the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice. And the curse and oath that are written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out upon us because we have sinned against him. He has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us and against our rulers who ruled us by bringing upon us a great calamity. For under the whole heaven there has not been done anything like what has been done against Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come upon us Yet we have not entreated the favor of the Lord our God, turning from our iniquities and gaining insight by your truth. Therefore the Lord has kept the calamity and has brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works that he has done, and we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord, our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and have made a name for yourself, as at this day we have sinned, we have done wickedly. O Lord, According to all your righteous acts, let your anger and your wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy hill, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a byword among all who are around us. Now, therefore, O our God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his pleas for mercy, and for your own sake, O Lord, make your face to shine upon your sanctuary, which is desolate. O my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations in the city that is called by your name. We do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake. O my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. This is God's word. Who here does not want quick relief? I found a book called Instant Relief on Amazon that promises to relieve all manner of uh, muscle pain. There are a ton of pills and medications out there that boast of providing rapid results. I even found a color of paint from Glidden called Instant Relief. Wouldn't you love some Instant Relief prayer? I mean, imagine praying and then having an angel appear who says, request heard, how can I help? Yeah, right, like that could happen. I am happy to report that exactly that happened to a man of prayer named Daniel. And he was kind enough to write down exactly how he prayed and what happened. Interested? Now, let's get some background first before we jump into this prayer. Daniel is at a key historical juncture that is going to profoundly affect his prayer life. So to understand how his prayer is shaped by his circumstances, we need to get a sense of the narrative, uh, prophetic portions of Daniel, see how they all fit together and kind of get the big picture. So we're going to do a little chart stuff here. So here's the historical timeline. Uh, Daniel's ministry lasted for about 70 years. Now, the majority of his ministry occurred during a period of Babylonian supremacy. Babylon became the reigning world power in about 605 BC, and they were upstaged by Medo-Persia in 539 BC. So 
the majority of Daniel's ministry is occurring during the season of Babylon, also the gold empire in the image that Nebuchadnezzar saw. So the narrative chapters, which are chapters one through six of Daniel, describe events that can be positioned on this timeline. For example, the king's choice food, that's chapter one. That happened right at the beginning of Nebuchadnezzar's reign in 605. Nebuchadnezzar's dream was shortly after that, so in the early stages of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. The fiery furnace was not long after that. So chapters one, two, and three are describing things that happened early in Nebuchadnezzar's reign. Chapter four, which was the pride pill where Nebuchadnezzar went out to the fields and behaved like a cow, that happened closer to the end of his reign, maybe in the last 10 years of his reign. Chapter five, which is the writing on the wall, that occurred on the last day of Belshazzar's reign. So that was really the, the last 24 hours of Babylon's supremacy until they were conquered by Cyrus and Darius, also his name, became the, the first ruler of the Medo-Persian Empire who had conquered them. The lion's den incident, that's chapter six, occurred in the early year, maybe the first year or so, of Darius's reign. So that's where the history fits. Now we'll just push those events or those chapters down, and now what we're gonna do is see the prophecy chapters, which are chapters seven through 12. These are prophecies that Daniel experienced. So the first vision that he had is in chapter seven. And in that vision, he saw four beasts followed by a super horn who was conquered by the son of man. And that vision occurred in the first year of Belshazzar, who was the last king of Babylon. Chapter eight, which we looked at last week and the week before that, showed us two beasts, the two middle beasts of the succession of four, and then it focused in on the little horn, which was broken without human intervention. This morning, we're looking at chapter nine, which is about a prayer for God to conclude 70 years of exile for Israel, that actually is happening in the very first year of Cyrus. So if you were to line up the narrative chapters and align that with the prophetic chapters, what we're reading about in the passage that Catherine read is the prayer of Daniel at the very time that he was ramping up to going in the lion's den. This is a glimpse into his prayer life in the first year of the reign of Cyrus. So when you see those two things together, it's going to help you with some things that I will show you a little later on. Daniel chapter 9 describes Daniel's prayer focus after the fall of Babylon and leading up to the lion's den incident. In chapter 6, we've read about how he was committed to praying and he was praying facing Jerusalem. I wonder if that's related to what we're reading about in chapter 9. One more thing. Daniel's prayer is offered at a key juncture. He has just witnessed the confirmation of a significant batch of prophecies. The gold layer in the image, he's seen the end of the gold. He's seen the fall of the lion. That's from the vision in chapter 7. And the rise of the silver which is chapter two, or the bear, chapter seven, or the ram, chapter eight. So basically what he's seeing is this era ended and the new era has begun. So understanding that is gonna help you understand something of what Daniel is praying for. Now, as we go through this passage, and we're just doing the first half of it, we are going to read Daniel's prayer journal. He's actually written down for us what he was praying during this time. And he prayed daily. In fact, probably multiple times each day he was praying this prayer. Now the second half of chapter nine is gonna tell us how Daniel's prayer was answered. But we won't get to that until next week. So this week we're just gonna analyze how did Daniel pray? What was that about? 
And Daniel is a prayer pro. So we can learn how to pray well from observing what he did. And we're going to extract four principles from the book of Daniel that speak to how he prayed so well. So in the beginning, we we read about uh, Daniel's preparation. It says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus of Median descent, who was made king over the kingdom of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, so see, we're at this first year of the Medo-Persian Empire, I, Daniel, observed in the books the number of the years which was revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet for the completion of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. So he's been reading Jeremiah, and he's, something's piqued his interest. So I gave my attention to the Lord God to seek him by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. Here's principle number one, and I'll help develop it in a minute, but just so you know what it is, Daniel clearly used prayer to connect Scripture to his circumstances. Basically, he was reading something in the Word, and he was saying, that connects to what I'm dealing with right now. And so prayer became the vehicle for affirming that connection. He's identifying things that the Bible says that speak to his and his people's current condition. He's looking at what is happening. And he's going, I see a perfect correspondence. He's making a connection between what's happening and what Jeremiah said a long time ago. He was reading something that suggested the Babylonian captivity would end soon or could end soon. So what was he reading? Uh, do, we, do we know what he was reading? Yes. Jeremiah 29.1 says, now, by the way, Jeremiah 29 is actually a letter that was delivered to the exiles in Babylon from Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a prophet who was in Jerusalem until the fall of Jerusalem and shortly thereafter, and then he went with the the remnant to Egypt. But he sent a letter to the exiles in Babylon. And here's what it says in the first of it. Now these are the words of the letter which Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the rest of the elders of the exile, the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Now Jeremiah didn't deliver the letter. He actually gave it to one of his understudies and he said take this letter which is like a five or six hundred mile journey it would take a few months he said take that to Babylon here's what they need to know and here's verse 10 from that chapter it says for thus says the Lord when 70 years have been completed for Babylon I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place So that's what Daniel was reading. (laughs) He's going, Jeremiah sent the prophecy to us here in Babylon in which God specifically says, 70 years and then I'm going to bring you back. Daniel is praying for things that God declares in his word that he intends to do. He's seeing what God's intentions are and he's using scripture to be able to identify that God intends to take us back so I'm going to plead with God to do that so if we were to pray in a similar way and take a cue from Daniel we would peruse scripture before entering our petition and we would identify what does God say about what I'm dealing with What does God want to give me in the specific situation that I'm dealing with? Now, I I brought this as an example. So we have been using these cards to pray for the six challenges that we have been dealing with. And I'm delighted at the progress that God has graciously provided. But what you'll notice in each one of these prayer requests is there's a verse before the request 
that informs the request. It's a way of saying we're asking God for the things that align with his word. That's how Daniel prayed well. Listen to this passage. This is Ecclesiastes 5.2. It says, Do not be hasty in word or impulsive in thought to bring up a matter in the presence of God, for God is in heaven and you're on the earth. Therefore, let your words be few. There's make your words count. Jesus said this, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it shall be done for you. When my prayer is word-driven, word-informed, when I'm asking for things that God in his word says are the right things to ask for, God says, now I like that prayer. I want to answer that. In verses 4 through 6, Daniel's confession begins. And he says, I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed and said, Alas, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keeps his commandments. Get this. We have sinned, committed iniquity, acted wickedly and rebelled, even turning aside from your commandments and ordinances. Moreover, we have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, our fathers, and all the people of the land. I find this remarkable. This is, this is Daniel we're talking about. Daniel is as good a man as I know. And yet he's owning the sin of the people of which he is a part. And he's broken by it. He's not praying this way. I mean, this is how I would be inclined to pray. Father, your people are losers. They don't deserve this. Now, I love you. I'm, you know, I'm not in this group, but they are a problem. He doesn't say that. He says, we. In other words, he's confessing the sin of a people of which he is a part. And I find that remarkable. So here's principle number two of an amazing prayer. Acknowledge how sin looks in God's eyes. Because as Daniel looks back on the past of his people, he weeps. You deserve better from us, God. And he's truly broken over sin. He's really serious, he says. So I gave my attention to the Lord God to seek him by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. He doesn't find ways to justify the actions of himself and those around him. There's no justification for what was done. He does not blame God for their situation. God is perfectly justified. His prayer is not a declaration of his disappointment in God. You know, why, God, haven't you done this? I'm disappointed in you. Listen to something that Jeremiah said to Israel. This is actually before Nebuchadnezzar showed up in 605 and eventually in 586 when he destroyed the city. Listen to Jeremiah 615. And he's speaking of Israel. Were they ashamed? because of the abominations they have done, they were not even ashamed at all. They did not even know how to blush. Therefore, they shall fall among those who fall at the time that I punish them. They shall be cast down, says the Lord. Before the fall of Jerusalem, Israel's problem was they could not mourn over sin. Isaiah tells us, But to this one I will look, to him who is humble and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word. God loves the prayer of the brokenhearted. Isaiah 30, 15. 
For thus the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel has said, in repentance and rest you will be saved. In quietness and trust is your strength, but you were not willing. Now I have found this principle to be very challenging. Uh, in the last year, I've been working on this one. I am trying to grow in my ability to confess the sin of the people of which I am a part, of the nation of which I am a part. You know, it's easy to be outraged at the things that we see all around us, and I am. But I've been praying prayers like this. Father, forgive us for the ways in which we don't honor you. We don't honor life. We don't honor what you say is right. We need, we need to be a people who are truly broken by the things that break God's heart. And that brokenness needs to inform our prayer. Effective prayer in Daniel's case, sees through God's eyes. You know, there's an incident in the life of Jesus that I'm so struck by. This is recorded in Luke 19.41. Jesus has just come over the, the Mount of Olives. He's on the ascent to Jerusalem, coming from the east. And he crests the mount, and he sees Jerusalem, and he starts crying. He's weeping. And he's saying, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. You don't see the day of visitation. You don't have a clue what's coming. Daniel's prayer, which is a model prayer, comes from a man who is able to say, I am part of a people who have dishonored you. He owns the consequences. In verses 13 and 14, he says, as it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come on us, yet we've not sought the favor of the Lord our God by turning from our iniquity and giving attention to your truth. Therefore, the Lord has kept the calamity in store and brought it on us. For the Lord our God is righteous with respect to all his deeds which he has done. But we have not obeyed his voice. Now he says, as it is written in the law of Moses. So apparently Daniel was not just reading Jeremiah. He was reading Moses, the Pentateuch. I don't know if he had a copy of all the books of the Bible that had been written by this point but he's pretty well versed in what he does have that we get to see. So what's he talking about? 900 years before Daniel prayed this prayer, 900 years, when Israel had come out of the land of Egypt and God had rescued them and they now stood poised to move into the land of promise, Moses, in Deuteronomy, second law, says, let me remind you about what we're about to do. And this is what he said in, in verse 15 of Deuteronomy 28. He says, but it shall come about if you do not obey the Lord your God to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes with which I charge you today that all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. The Lord will bring a nation against you from far, from the end of the earth, as the eagle swoops down, a nation whose language you shall not understand, a nation of fierce countenance who shall have no respect for the old, nor shall favor to the young. By the way, here's another example of scripture-driven prayer on Daniel's part. Basically, what he's saying is, you told us 900 years before... And I, before my day when Israel you go into the land if you turn your back on God there will be consequences 
Daniel's not blaming God. Israel is in a pickle of her own making. And the justice of God is at work. He said, if you go into the land and you defy me, this is what will happen. God is simply following through with what he said. Daniel knows that striking bargains or making promises has no value. When the one in need of help is in trouble precisely because of being a world-class promise breaker. That's what Israel was. Which means, get this, if you don't take anything away, get this. God's loving kindness is Israel's only hope. They're not going to be able to bargain with God and say, well, God, we, we promise we'll really do better this time. They are reaping what they have sown. And so what Daniel says is, to the Lord our God belong compassion and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him. Daniel's only hope is in the graces of God, the graces of compassion and forgiveness. Daniel is grounding his request on grace, which is the third principle for prayer. He's saying, I am going to plead with you, not because we've earned it or deserve it, but simply because I know who you are. You're a God of grace. And that kind of prayer is especially warranted when what you're praying about is an outcome, a consequence of what you've done. So if we were to take our cue from Daniel, we would acknowledge ways in which we are asking God to take action in spite of what we have done. Uh, to recount what we know about him. God, I know who you are. You're a God who, whom it pleases to show good to those who don't deserve it. That's who you are. And so... Daniel finds character connections to the situation. He says, you're a God of loving kindness. Uh, interestingly, in this chapter, he introduces chazev, which is the word for God's covenant love. First time it shows up in Daniel. Let me give you an example of how this works, okay? I am, based upon my experience getting acquainted with the people of First of Anne, I am confident that there are many in this congregation who have children or friends or relatives who have walked away from God. And it's, it's eating at you, it's hurting you, it's, it's in the back of your mind all the time. Well, what do I know about God that could inform my prayer for such a one? Well, when Jesus was confronted by the religious leaders, <laughs> they, they displayed uh, a failure to understand the heart of God. And so Jesus told them some stories, some parables that were designed to help them understand who God is. And there were actually three of them, and they're in a sequence. He starts out with 100 to 1, then 10 to 1, then 1 to 1. Remember, do you know what they are? Lost sheep, lost coin, prodigal son. So let's just take the lost sheep one and try and see how that connects. Jesus told that story because he's saying, I want you to understand who Father is. Father has a heart for lost sheep. And he will go out into the wild where he will rescue them from the brambles in which they've caught them. So if I'm going to pray for a lost son or a lost daughter... I'm going to plead with the Lord based upon the fact that, God, you love lost sheep. And I am asking you to rescue someone because I know that you are the God of rescue. 
You are like the father who is in delight when his son comes back. That's who you are. I'm pleading with you to do that for my son, for my daughter, for my mom, for my friend. Here's Daniel's request. What does he actually ask God to do? Oh my God, incline your ear and hear, open your eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by your name. For we are not presenting our supplications before you on account of any merits on our own, but on account of your great compassion, O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, listen and take action for your own sake. Oh my God, do not delay because your city and your people are called by your name. Daniel is making his appeal based on a desire for God to be viewed favorably by the nations. He's saying, would you please do this for your sake, for your name's sake, in order to give people a more accurate understanding of who we know you to be. In his prayer, he actually recounts how that God did this previously. He said, you did this before. This is Daniel 9, 15. Oh, now our Lord, our God, who has brought thy people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and has, get this, made a name for thyself. You showed people who you are. You're not like the gods of Egypt. You're a God who's good who is compassionate, who is powerful, and who is our ally. So Daniel says, do it again. So now, our God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his supplication. And for your sake, O Lord, let your face shine on your desolate sanctuary. I love this quote by uh, J.G. Baldwin that I think helps to understand what's going on here. Here's what is said. The captivity of Judah and the non-existence of the Jerusalem sanctuary were interpreted by the nations to mean that Judah's God was either powerless or a delusion. The fact that God's name has been dishonored by the disciplinary measures his people have forced him to take makes the appeal to him to vindicate his righteousness a powerful plea. We defied you. And your justice requires what we reaped in the fall of Jerusalem and exile to Babylon. But because of that, many have concluded that you are less than we know you to be. So I'm pleading with you to fulfill what you have said in your word you would do and restore us to the land as a way of making it clear, obvious, irrefutable. You are the good God that we know you to be. And so here's principle number four. Daniel is praying from a passion for God to be well thought of. Daniel recognizes that God has done what is right toward Israel. He did what was appropriate given their rebellion against him, blatant, unrelenting rebellion against him. Even though it's come at a price to God, of being easily misrepresented. Daniel is saying, I only want to receive your blessing in a way that makes you look good. You know, we sing praises to God when we gather. It's a way of adoring him. An effective prayer life seeks to swell the ranks of those who praise him. To to pray in a way like Daniel is to say, I want you, Father, to answer my prayer so that there are more and more people who are able to say, I cannot believe the goodness of God. So when you pray, ask yourself this question. If God were to answer my prayer request, in what way would it positively reflect on him? And then... Would I use this answer to fuel praise? A number of years ago, uh, Rochelle and I went through a a challenging time uh, with a son who was diagnosed with cancer and then an insurance company that said, that's on you. And God did amazing things, answered prayer. 
One of the things that I so appreciated about Rochelle is it didn't matter who she was talking to or where she was going. Her answer was, let me tell you what God has done. <laughs> That's what Daniel's saying. Answer this prayer so that I can tell people what I already know, but they need to know too who you are. So here's our four principles. Daniel used prayer to connect scripture and circumstance. He acknowledged how sin looks in God's eyes. He grounded his request on grace, and he prayed from a passion for God to be well thought of. That's how he was praying. So what happened? Gabe showed up. At the beginning of your supplications, this is from verse 23, and we'll talk about this more next week. At the beginning of your supplications, the command was issued, and I, Gabriel, have come to tell you. Now, think about this for a minute. Last week, we looked at something that happened about 15 years earlier, in which Gabriel came and talked to Daniel and said, let me help you understand this vision of these, you know, the, this goat and this ram. So Gabriel came. Now, let's move forward 13, 15 years, something like that. And Daniel was pleading. He's read Jeremiah. And he said, it looks to me like we could go back to the land. God, will you do this? And while Daniel's praying, he hears something. He looks up. Hey, Daniel. Gabe? Is that you? <laughs> you know what I also find quite interesting? It says in Daniel 6, remember? Daniel 6 and this chapter 9 happen at the same time. When the king said to Daniel, Daniel, are you okay? When he came in the morning to find out where he was in the lion's den. And here's what Daniel said. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths. And they have not harmed me inasmuch as I was found innocent before him. And also toward you, O king, I have committed no crime. Now, is Gabriel that one? And was this tied to what's happening in chapter 9? I don't know. But I am very struck by the coincidence. You know what I mean? Uh, Daniel was rescued because, of, because a kind of a lion-taming angel was dispatched and right about this time is when Gabriel shows up and says, hey, Daniel, you've been praying for a few weeks. Uh, when you started praying, I was dispatched to talk about the answer to your prayer. Daniel's prayer was based on Jeremiah 29.10, and I read that to you earlier. Thus says the Lord God, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to bring you back to this place. And God did that. We'll read about that uh, as we go along in a later sermon. But Jeremiah 29, verses 11 through 14, take it way further than just the mere return of the people to Israel. Let me read verses 11 through 14. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and will gather you from all the nations from all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from where I sent you into exile. Now, all I'm going to tell you at the moment is Daniel's prayer for a prompt end to the Babylonian exile is going to be answered, in fact, in a couple years from the time he's praying it. But as Gabriel is going to explain, what happens when some exiles return to Jerusalem is just the start of the story. And there is so much more that is yet to come. Now, Daniel's going to explain. 
that something far better than mere relocation is coming. Stay tuned next week. What I want to do is uh, close our service by praying a Daniel prayer. I thought a lot about how can we pray given where we are and what's going on in our lives in a way that is somewhat informed by how Daniel prayed. So I invite you to pray along with me. We read Romans 1 and find ourselves staring into a mirror. The people among whom we dwell do not honor you as God, nor recognize you as the one to whom we owe our thanks for every good thing. We worship and serve ourselves rather than you, the one who made us and made our world. We do not acknowledge you as the one who is fit to declare what is right. We deserve the consequences of a rebellion against you, and to these you have given us over, and rightly so. But we know that you love us, and this people enough to sacrifice your own son in order to promote our true good. We know that you are patient, not willing for any to perish, and we know that you are standing at the door, even now knocking. And so we are asking two things of you based on your word. First, help us to do our part as ambassadors of grace in this graceless world. Help us as your bondservants not to be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who oppose you and your word. As you help us do our part, we ask you to do what only you can do for the people among whom we dwell. Give them the gift of repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. Help them come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. Pour out your kindness on this people and give us not what we deserve, but what shouts you are the God of abundant grace. We are a people of little strength, but we serve a God who is our all in all. Make this the mindset of the people among whom we dwell because you are good and deserving of all praise. We ask all this in the name of Jesus, who is our Savior. Amen.